salutare ringraziando effettivamente tutti voi per aver già partecipato, Roberto Morera in particolare, e vi invito a restare e passare ora fra due minuti prendendo il soffio, il respiro, eh, per passare subito a partire dalle 5 alla sessione internazionale. Grazie e eh, a presto. E viva il memorandum dei cittadini, cioè dire i cittadini. Viva la storia dei cittadini e eh, non la storia dei dominanti. Ah, a più tardi allora. Grazie. Grazie a te Riccardo. Eh, in realtà... Eh, il, link, un... Roberto, il link è sempre lo stesso, vero? Restiamo collegati qui o dobbiamo... Ah, qui, restate qui e eh, noi continuiamo adesso la sessione internazionale. internazionale eh. e... Se ce la fai Roberto a iniziare subito sarebbe bene, fantastico. Sì, no, iniziamo subito anche perché abbiamo già alcuni ospiti con noi e a cui chiedo anche di verificare il funzionamento della traduzione simultanea cioè, in modo da poter... Buongiorno Roberto, buongiorno Riccardo. Buongiorno Pierre Gallo. Ciao Pierre. Hello Pierre. Va bene, io... Interessante sapere, Madame uh, Manon Aubry è già là? Is Madame Manon Aubry with us already? Je vois que Marc Botenga è là. Marc Botenga is with us. La troisième après Roberto e moi. And Manon is going to be the second speaker. Straight after Roberto's introduction and then my speech. Riccardo, I can briefly introduce the meeting and I would then leave the floor to Connie de Grand, who is the co-chair of Transform Europe. Okay. Is she with us? Yes, she is. Allora, eh, okay, very well. So, thank you. Thank you for being with us. We promoted this initiative on the occasion of the Global Health Summit to promote a European citizens initiative, not to confront the, those in power worldwide, but rather to share with many people an exit strategy out of the pandemic, but more in general out of the crisis that global capitalism is causing in the planet and that is harming humans, plants, animals, and all living creatures. A crisis that was accelerated by the pandemic, but that has deep roots, which we intend to analyze and to fight against. So this initiative has been conceived as a global initiative because it is not a domestic matter. The G20 is being held in Italy and the power of the most industrialized countries in the world is only aimed at preserving the status quo, which is the cause of the difficulties that we are experiencing in our lives, that the environment is exposed to, that women and men on this planet are exposed to. I will immediately leave the floor to Riccardo, who will introduce with me this panel, along an intensive panel with participants from all over the world in order to together develop a citizen's memorandum, a first step to build our strength, a strength needed to impose different choices which are required in order to save humanity. Thank you very much, uh, and 
Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure for us to have you with us and to know that you wish to contribute to this common reflection. We have organized this three hours in th two sessions. So the first one will concern an analysis of the situation. And the second session will concern propositions, our proposals, and the most difficult part, but also the most uh, challenging one. Each of us will have 10 minutes initially, 10 minutes per session, and four minutes for the second session. We have a simultaneous interpretation service so that um, that we can communicate, but please do not talk too fast, because if you talk too fast in order to say many things during your uh, four minutes, interpreters might have any difficulties in uh, translating correctly. And uh, so there's a risk of miscommunication, so please speak slowly. We will also have a break at half four to connect with the um, uh, with the demonstration that is ongoing in Liège in Belgium, and then we will also connect with another demonstration that is uh, ongoing in Brussels, and. Uh, you will hear more about it when we will directly connect with the citizens that are participating to this other um, counter summit to contrast the current health policies. As you may have noticed, I. I I've, uh, I've already um, told you to please stick to your time slot so that everyone gets a chance to speak. We may have some slight changes along the way because perhaps some speakers will not be able to stay with us for the entire time, so we might have to adjust a little. Allow me also to remind you that the aim of this initiative is uh, that uh, a number of organizations have decided uh, on the occasion of the G20 not to hold a counter summit, but rather to engage in a reflection directly concerning our proposals because we all believe that the G20 is, cannot resolve the issues at stake because uh, the leaders of the G20 are responsible for what is ongoing. So it is up to us to come up with our recommendations and identify the routes that we should take to gather and identify common commitments. And this is what our aim is tonight, to promote a greater commitment. Having said so, I will leave the floor to our speakers. We decided that perhaps we could start by Manon Aubry, who is the co-chair of the left, of the United left at the European Parliament. So, Manon, please, the floor is yours. And again, you have 10 minutes in total, six minutes for the first session, four minutes for the second. But given that Manon uh, will not be able to stay with us for the entire time, she will have 10 minutes now. Thank you very much. I'll stick to the eight minutes. I'd like to thank you all for this organization of this virtual meeting today. 
which is uh, important. Uh, you, you were talking about the um, uh, World Health Organization meeting and the WTO meeting, which occurred a few weeks ago here in the parliament. We've been fighting for one year to remove the patents on uh, vaccines. We have been uh, isolated uh, in, this, in this effort. Uh, in the parliament and elsewhere, this was a problem which was not addressed by other political parties as an essential issue. So the mobilization that we join in was the NGOs, the associations, and I have in mind the specific NGOs and organizations. This has forced the European Union to take up this issue. So we uh, had the opportunity of putting on the agenda uh, as the left group in the parliament. We have uh, put this on the table as a theme and uh, we were not joined by other political groups. They felt that, that uh, the market would take care of all the health care problems. They felt that the market was the only one the solution to the current crisis. We've seen that this resulted into a major failure, a scarcity of vaccines at the international level, which was organized by those who were sort of protecting uh, uh, the pharmaceutical laboratories. So, uh, and uh, this was uh, basically uh, not an effort which was undertaken by the large, a small group of very rich countries, the international community, uh, and especially the poorest countries were left uh, without the possibility of having the vaccines. For the European Union, uh, there will be a certain amount of vaccine doses. And then whilst in the other poor countries, there will be zero uh, availability of vaccines. So we have to fight to do away with the patents and ensure that the whole of the planet can be, people living on the planet can all be vaccinated at the same time. We don't, we, we have to think in terms of the various variables which could uh, act in such a way that the current vaccines would not be able to counter such uh, variants. Uh, this is a fight that we should unite uh, in, be uh, united in. And our position at the European Parliament is to remind everyone that the European Commission and the European countries have bowed to the, the big pharma and the pharmaceutical laboratories and their position. We as uh, European members of parliament uh, have not taken a strong position to ensure that it would be a way of doing away from with the patents for the vaccines. Uh, what was at stake basically in this narrative was to make sure the vaccines be produced in large quantities and reduce the margins and the profits uh, that pharmaceutical companies make. Think of Pfizer, they have had 3 billion profits. When you think that the CEO of Moderna, the Frenchman, has become part of the uh, number one of the most, the richest persons in the world. So, and they have a, a monopoly uh, situation in that, and they can increase their profits and increase the, uh, the price. Well, they initially sold them at 
12 euros and two euros, and now it went up to 19 euros. So they have increased gradually, like a sort of, so, and they have become a sort of a, um, a way of increasing the profits of big farming. So whilst we should think in terms of increasing the productive capabilities, according to a UNICEF study, uh, there is a large capability, productive capability, which is not being used at international level. A large uh, laboratory can produce the large amount of vaccines, but they have to have access to the patent. That's why we fight uh, to do away with the, with the patents and ensure that uh, we increase the production capabilities at international level to ensure that the largest number possible number of people would receive the vaccines to reduce uh, the restrictions on the access to vaccines so that the uh, lo logic of solidarity would prevail on the logic of profit. And I'd like to conclude by saying that we've wasted a great deal of time. It's true for months now. We haven't uh, managed uh, to address this issue, the World Health Organization uh, has many leaders uh, in the scientific field. Well, and, uh, and finally, the declaration by Joe Biden has put pressure to bear on the European Union position saying we we'll have to sort of uh, produce uh, vaccines for everyone without taking a position on the removal of the patents on vaccines. This was what Ursula van der Leyen has uh, stated, and, uh, and uh, which is a uh, impeding any negotiations for the removal of the uh, patents. Uh, so it, it took a great deal of effort to have this um, issue being put on the table at a political level. There were a number of ideas and which were sort of uh, taken up by a number of uh, politicians. They have been using the language of um, pharmaceutical lobbies. I think we should put an end to the hypocritical position. We have to denounce the role that they have uh, played and, uh, and ensure that uh, others will join in our fight to, to do away with the patents on vaccines uh, so that we can uh, sort of ensure that uh, we can uh, sort of take immediately action. If we don't take action, we're all to be blamed. And we, so we, the left of the European Parliament, we want to do away with this uh, position and we want to remove the position vis a vis the pharmaceutical laboratories. And now I would leave the floor to Heinz Bierbaum, the uh, uh, chair of the left party. They tell me that I can keep on speaking French, but Heinz, you can speak English or Italian as you prefer. Heinz, uh, Heinz Thank, you Birbaum. Thank you very much uh, for being invited to this uh, panel. I think it's really very important. And um, as you, sorry, as you know, you have now six minutes and then uh, and the second part, you will have other four minutes. Now it's the description of problems. Sorry to remember this kind of game. I, I know, I know the rules and uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult uh, to separate between uh, <laughs> yes. the, uh, the description of the situation and the proposals because they are linked to each other. 
And thank you very much uh, once again for being invited to this, uh, this really very important uh, panel because it's a kind of a counter summit uh, concerning uh, the summit, uh, the World Health Summit of the GE20. Uh, and therefore, I think it's really very important and I appreciate very much uh, this initiative um, uh, move up 2021, but because I think it's really very important, and I appreciate also uh, the memorandum, uh, because it's I think it's it's very very uh, good and very important, because we have a very a very difficult situation, and I agree that health and healthcare uh, is really are uh, really global issues, not uh, only national or European, are global issues, and they have to be addressed globally and um, uh, we have really uh, concerning the situation of health and healthcare globally a very dramatic situation and but we have to take into uh, to account that the dramatic si uh, uh, situation existed uh, even before the pandemic. The pandemic has worsened the situation, but we had already a very difficult situation concerning, um, uh, for example, the social conditions, the health uh, situation and so on. And concerning Europe, the European Union uh, for many years is in a very deep crisis economically, socially and politically. And uh, economically we have to uh, look at the employment and the high, we have a high unemployment, we have uh, increasing social inequalities even in the pandemic and the gap between the rich and the poor has increased even in the pandemic and we have to take into good consideration this situation, it was certainly aggravated by the pandemic and it was worsened by the pandemic and um, uh, coming back to Europe, I know it's not only a European issue, it's a global issue, but coming back to Europe, because I'm um, uh, speaking for the party of the European left, you know the situation uh, in Europe is concerning the health situation, um, in my opinion, a little bit chaotic, because uh, you know, the main concern in Europe, and it is written also in the document, is a vaccination, and uh, but there is no coordination. It's not really a coordinated activity by the European Union. We have very different positions, and I think it was really um, uh, a, a, a fatal error made by uh, our Chancellor, still Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel, to refuse uh, uh, to um, to abolish the, uh, the patents. And I think we have very different positions uh, between, for example, Macron, uh, who is uh, uh, who attempts to to use this situation for his presidential elections next year. Uh, but we have really a very uh, uncoordinated situation in Europe, and um, about the vaccination, there are different positions concerning the European left, the party of the European left. And that was already said by Manon Aubry. And we uh, uh, work uh, closely together, the left uh, group in the European Parliament and the party of the European left uh, about vaccination. It's really a shame. And therefore we uh, support, uh, we strongly support the European citizens initiative right to cure or no profit on pandemic. I think that's really uh, very important to have a free access to, uh, the, to the vaccines and um, it should be really a common good and not something uh, of which uh, the big pharma makes profit. But we have also to take into account, and th I, I think that's also the advantage of the memorandum, that the European situation is better or the situation in the north as it's as it is said in the document. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, better than the situation in the South. It's really dramatic, uh, the global situation concerning the vaccines because they don't have ex access to the vaccine. And therefore we need 
pre-access and we need pre-production. We need an abolishment of the, of the patents and we can't leave it all to the big pharma. That's, I think, uh, must be our concern. And therefore we have to work uh, together globally. I think that's, that's really uh, crucial. That's really very important. And, and, and therefore I appreciate this initiative to coordinate this to make it uh, a global issue and that all the left and bureaucracy forces uh, work together concerning the uh, current situation, in particular, uh, particular concerning health and healthcare. And Great. therefore, I think we should continue with that. And we have, of course, some concrete proposal. I will come back yeah. to this in the second part, Ricardo. Don't okay. worry, I will come back to this. And yes. uh, now I. I really want to underline the necessity of uh, an exchange of the situation we are facing worldwide, we are facing globally, and therefore, once again, thank you very much for being invited Great. to this thank event. Thank you to you for the moment. Now I will leave the floor to Pierre Ganon. La Belgique. Former aussi, Pierre Galland, former Belgian senator, and someone with a great experience in global struggles, for example, for the rights of the Palestinian people or for the rights to a secular culture. And uh, uh, Pierre, given that uh, uh, you will have to leave later on, you have 10 minutes for both analysis and proposals. Good morning. And I am sorry if I will have to leave, but there is another webinar that I will have to attend later on on solidarity with Palestine. Now, big we gave uh, uh, big, big Pharma a large number of uh, funding for um, uh, funding the vaccines, and they have sort of uh, have been managing the pandemic as if it were a market issue, and uh, uh, we should no longer accept uh, this so uh, approach based on the market by the by big pharma so uh, we have to make sure that our life is the same as uh, the life of people living in the south uh, and there shouldn't be competition between us all uh, when we hear big pharma and their position we see that there are very very it's a devastating consequences uh, for the citizens of the world and, uh, and uh, for human rights. Well, the big pharma spokesperson have no legitimacy, neither has the IMF or the World Trade Organization or NATO have legitimacy uh, in that respect that they have taken power and we have to ensure that we can uh, uh, ensure that they not, would no longer have the power. Let's go back to the Charter of the United Nations and give voice to the people. I have had a webinar with the people from Congo and then they told us, we don't want your vaccine. We want the know-how you have, the knowledge you have, because our people, the citizens, uh, our citizens cannot be vaccinated because uh, Oh, you, we have not given us the know-how for that. So let's go back to the Charter of the UN and the fulfillment of what's in the Charter. Yeah, we have to share resources. Uh, many such resources are basically resulting from the plundering by the North of the resources of the South. So we have to come up with common services for the whole of the humankind with a proper management of healthcare policies so that there is a common policy that applies is applicable to all the citizens. Uh, 
So we have to avoid uh, committing crimes against the humankind because there are many people that are dying because of such policies. So we have to engage in a very crucial fight for the, to ensure the survival of humanity. The, we'll have to so to bring pressure to bear to our politicians and political representatives that have been accepting the logic of big pharma. The true pandemic is neoliberalism and competition. We have to replace this with another notion of cooperation amongst the people. Cooperation, which is based on one priority, the respect of life, of all lives. And this requires to do away with one of the greatest uh, obstacle, which is the arms race, which is generated by competition within the leading uh, powers uh, to sort of grab the land grabbing from other countries. And we have to ensure uh, that we reflect on a new sort of policy to achieve peace, which would be such a possibility of providing happiness to all the wretched peoples in the world. And that is our wish. So I will be with you, but I have to go now because I have to talk about Palestine and Palestinian rights. There are many peoples today that want to be free they want to achieve independence and we are stand by them we are for the people that want to be liberated so so it's a common fight that we're all involved in for the well-being of the humankind as a whole thank you pierre Même les notions de la politique. opening up our notions of, of policy the, policy which is followed by the citizens. I think that these are words uh, that uh, are pro which are very much appreciated by our friend, by our friend, Mark Motenga. Good morning, I hope you can hear me well. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing this event. I will stick to, to my six minutes by uh, some of the considerations made by the general director of the World Health Organization just yesterday. He said that uh, we uh, have, um, we are now in a situation of a world appetite on vaccines when it comes uh, to the disparities in accessing vaccines between the north and the south of the world. Despite this, we see that European countries and the European Commission do not intend to overcome the main obstacle, which is that of patents, and they should abolish or even just temporarily suspend the patents. And, and there have been hundreds of thousands of signatures to the European citizens' initiatives by two coalitions demanding a waiver on trips but the Commission refuses to do so. And they say that we cannot do that because we are to thank pharmaceutical companies because without them, we would have never had such a fast access to vaccines. Now, I would perhaps like to take the occasion to contradict this statement. Number one, on the fact that we would have never gotten the vaccines so fast, because research on vaccines against coronavirus did not start in 2020. It started in 2013 on the occasion of the first epidemic of the SARS. 
mainly in uh, South Asia. Uh, that back in, in 2003, and then it continued in 2012. And in 2016, an American team almost came up with a vaccine, but they couldn't find investors. The European Commission on 20. 17 proposed a public-private partnership to research uh, um, on vaccines against uh, epidemics, but that was stopped because it was said that vaccines uh, are not that interesting in terms of the benefits for citizens. Now, um, deuxièmement, vous le savez, Num uh, number two, you also know that we had to neutralize all the risks for pharmaceutical company. So uh, we had in March and April abandoned the market principle and say we will take on all the um, ma market risks. Uh, we will take those risks upon us so that you speed up the process. So we had to take the process in our hands as public institutions. So it is not private companies, it is public authorities that made it possible to come up with COVID vaccines this quick. On the issue of the cost, uh, Pfizer is already mentioning in uh, uh, dialogue with investors that they will be increasing the cost of the second dose. Uh, this was said to investors, uh, to the Goldman Sachs investors in the US. And, uh, so we should say, well, Big farmers already given us give, received a lot of funds from us. And so I would like to use this last minute to discuss one aspect, the logics of capitalism, which is that of saying you will get the vaccine first. This means and and but you need to give up cooperation in order to have the vaccine first this means that we didn't get the best vaccine because we got the the first vaccine which needs to be uh, preserved at uh, initially at a few degrees below zero and now it has to be preserved at minus 20 degrees if the two main pharmaceutical companies had cooperated, they would have put their technology together and we would have gotten better results. But the compartmentalization made it so, the fact that each and every company worked separately, created a situation where there, where there was a race to get to the result first. And so capitalism somehow hindered the best possible achievement. And I'm saying this because I think we should emphasize the fact that uh, this whole discourse on the idea that we should thank Big Pharma is based on the wrong basis. And if we pharma, the fact that big pharma has limited the rights of each and every citizen, and they did that with public support. Um, State Minister at the Presidency of Senegal, unfortunately, she had uh, earlier assignments for the presidency, so she can't uh, be with us this afternoon. Uh, so we accept this, of course, but we could uh, 
we could uh, ask uh, Cornelia Hildebrand uh, to take the floor. Uh, she's the co-chair of Transform Europe, uh, the foundation which is in Luxembourg. Could you, could you hear me? Alice, yes. Oh, fine. Thanks. Also, I'm very happy to be invited and uh, in this conference. And I would to give you a, a broader way, a broader view from my point of view. And I'm pleased that the few from different regions of the world are also involved. Because the first Corona is the first global crisis that can directly affect anyone regardless of where they live. No one yeah. is safe from Corona unless everyone is safe. Yeah. Experiencing this global dimension directly is new. It's a challenge. It's an opportunity. Of course, Corona clearly show us the class character of this, of our society. It hit, it can hit anyone, but it hits especially those who had not connect, not protect themselves. It's the weakest in the society who are most affected. 164 million people are registered who have contracted Corona. More than 3 million registered people who have died of Corona. But these are only the official figures. No one real, the real figures, for example, for e India. No one knows many people have died because there was no room for them in the hospitals. The picture we saw from Bergamo have been repeated in many countries. And it is so hard to bear the picture of India. India, such country that produced vaccine, cannot even provide oxygen to the people in its own country. Too many people have died who, should, who could have been saved. The politicians who are responsible for this must be held accountable. Corona forces us ask the question about capitalism, the question of production and reproduction, the way of life and dealing with nature. The liberation theologians Leonardo Boff described at the meeting of the radical left in Germany some days ago that the pandemic is the expression of an economic unlimited growth paradigm that is reaching the limits of limited resources a paradigm linked to the DNA of capitalism, an economy that kills. And that economy kills. The pandemic shows us the brutality of the system. At the same time, the pandemic social and economic inequalities are growing. And we see America first, Europe first, the richest country first, my own country first. With Corona, another virus is also spreading the virus of nationalism and racism. Against these development, transnational initiatives are at the same time the fights against racism and nationalism. The pandemic should be understood as a warning that a fundamental whole and holistic transformation is needed. An economy and financial economy of life, a way of life that allow everyone to live with dignity and full respect of nature. We say from the point of the radical left, we need a new model of social eco ecological transformation. And we knew we need for thus such transformation, a new and broader alliances with social movements, with citizen initiatives worldwide, and of course include left-wing oriented people with different backgrounds. We need a humanism of practice with concrete projects and campaigns. And we need for these new forms of cooperation. The memorandum of citizen no profit on the people and planet, a global public health policy no, it's a good memorandum. We need to bring the political and social protest organizations together in new forms. We need the radi as a radical left, more European open forms of cooperation and of course strong connected with international cooperation, with the new forms of international solidarity. One format 
from our side is the European Forum of the Progressive Political Left, strong connected with social movements for Friday for Future, for example, for feminist protest organizations, culture and students organization, trade unions, and of course, citizen initiatives. And we, we need to define concrete steps, project campaigns, and for all of this, the first step. So for all of us, the first step should be one topic, the access of vaccine for all, release the patent for the vaccines. The German Chancellor declared that the Corona vaccine is a pub public, public good. good. Yes, yes, but, but she is not, not acting, acting like, like it. it. She, she defends the action of the pharmaceutical industry, the countries in Africa, some countries in Asia, the countries in the Balkans have no concrete promise of the delivery of vaccines until today. We have often talked about global social rights. This would be a way for a concrete global fight. We have, the, we have the duty to develop the concrete new forms and political global interventions. Strong connected with the social intervention. And that is a big challenge for us to connect the, the different levels and to interact the different levels. And I want also to come to the last point under the slogan, why to cure the European citizens initiative wants to call on the European Commission to make a good right. on the promise of the universal access by making the future COVID-19 vaccine a public good. And in such way, we have to go forward. Many thanks. Many thanks to you. You will have opportunity to come back to some of the points you made in the second part. Uh, and now it's a pleasure for me Infanti della to Mora. ask Luis Infanti della Mora, Bishop, of the Aishem Diocese in the north of Patagonia to take the floor. The bishop is very well known in Chile and elsewhere for his struggles for water and for important struggles as the one for a dam free Patagonia. Luis, would you take the floor? I can't see him. Is he not with us? No, perhaps we can uh, move on to the next speaker and we'll get back to him. So as we wait for our friend uh, Luis Infanti to join us, I would leave. Good afternoon. This is Alison back. back. Would you want me to take the floor now, Ricardo? Yes, absolutely. I hope it's not me who's getting the list wrong. No, you're not. It's it. it should be my turn. Okay, so Lilia, She is the head of the Arabic version of the Ecologist uh, magazine, and she's also a great um, advocate for human rights. Yes, well, the pandemic in the Middle East and in Northern Africa has created inequalities and was used to intensify repression, particularly at the expense of the most vulnerable individuals, uh, the refugees, uh, the migrants, or the political detainees in Lebanon. We have witnessed horrible uh, conditions for Syrian and Palestinian refugees and for uh, political prisoners in Egypt and Morocco. In the uh, Middle East, uh, 
economic sanctions who have been imposed on certain countries and also by certain uh, by the US and also by certain European countries and sanctioned countries uh, um, in sanctioned countries the civilians have had to take on the greatest impact of such sanctions and uh, so the conditions were very harsh vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic because the healthcare system was completely collapsing and not in a position to respond adequately. And in the Middle East, we have had a huge number of deaths. So, People in these countries are saying that uh, the cooperation system at the international level should be reorganized. The first proposition, second proposition, strengthening solidarity networks at the international level. That is very important nowadays. Uh, in these countries, uh, uh, interdependence uh, networks have been developed at the local level and they've played a vital role. We have seen a return to um, consumers' networks, uh, to family economies, uh, to a family agriculture in order to positively respond to the pandemic. And then uh, in these countries, uh, uh, we are very aware, well aware of the importance of the ecology and of the whole uh, of how important it is to resort to local production. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Lilia. It is wonderful how the word cooperation has already been mentioned by almost every speaker. So thank you also for uh, being so concise. And now uh, Vijay Prashad from India has joined us. But uh, the Intercontinental Institute for Social uh, Co Research that he directs asked him to um, take action, to, to take on certain commitments uh, uh, concerning the situation in Palestine and Gaza. So he said that he will join us at half past six. I would thus ask Armando De Negri, a doctor and uh, also an expert at the United Nations level on uh, human rights and is also the world coordinator of the Social World Forum on uh, Health. So thank you for being with us, Armando. Thank you, Ricardo. I welcome this extremely important initiative and uh, the call to the citizens of the world. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that you're from Brazil. And to, to, to face this challenge, as previous speakers have already said, and to um, understand the current challenge in global terms, meaning that no solution will be possible if not at the global level. But I also believe that we need to define strategies at the national level because, yes, we need to tackle the matter at the, at the world level, but also at the uh, macro-regional and national level, it is important, as in the case, for example, of the European Citizens' Initiative. So this is why I would emphasize a lot the um, 
question on what is the political content of this initiative. I would say that human rights are universal in their conception and implementation. And we need to contrast the naturalization of impossibility, meaning that certain rights need to become real for each and everyone, but this is connected to the material, to the material aspect, uh, to the material dimension. In the case of health, uh, the health needs to be organized around the principle of the common good and healthcare as a common good. And so, starting from this understanding, we started to say that in order for this to become a reality, we need to overcome the neoliberal notion that is based on the planning of poverty of misery, and I make explicit reference here to the idea that the system is organized around the principle of exclusion, a principle of limitations, meaning that if the system is unable to respond, it's not because it is not yet organized well enough, but because it is limited. Uh, there it is structured in such a manner. Uh, and so this lack of care is planned. And the asymmetry that we see in the case of access to vaccines, uh, this is not a random fact, but reflects the way that the system is uh, planned and organized at the global level. So the citizens' memorandum should explicitly make this philosophical limitation of the global system visible. And uh, this, of course, also requires a certain level of creativity of creativeness. So, Ricardo, it's similar to what you say when you speak of poverty has been made illegal, meaning that uh, the impoverished ones are impoverished by a social and political process. And a same model, a same understanding could be applied to healthcare meaning that in the health domain, there is a sort of permanent exclusion from the possibility to access a really universal system. And so seemingly to what we did in the case of poverty, also in the case of health, we should come up with laws at the national and international level that make it impossible to uh, um, hinder access to healthcare. Uh, Thank you very much. I would also like to ask uh, Luis Infanti, who should be with us now. Is, is Luis with us? Roberto, do you know? No, I'm afraid not. OK, well, then we will now ask Anibal Facendini who's Argentinian, but with an Italian heritage to take the floor. Uh, Annibal uh, has uh, worked on the issue of water at the university where he works, where he where is a professor. Hola. Hola. Uh, Hola. Uh, Aníbal tiene... Aníbal, Aníbal, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Can you hear me? Ah, 
no tiene problema. La línea no es buena. No. Here, the connection is not good. The connection no. is not good enough. Apparently, there is no connection. Alors, dans ce -là, so let's uh, move on. We can ask Roberto Savio and we'll ask Anibal later on. Okay. Alors, si, si Roberto Savio now, if Roberto Savio is available, well, could he take the floor at this stage? That would be good if he could. Could you use the microphone, please? Microphone, Roberto. Microphone, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry. Well, it's not good, the connection we have in Rosario. We don't know exactly why is there such a problem. So I'll be very brief uh, on, on behalf of Anibal and the chair for water. And I want to thank Ricardo and all of you for the, the your kind invitation. As was uh, the case with water, the fact that there was no access to water and this lack, lack of access to of water to water by the poorest people, the lack of water uh, supply. Uh, is uh, something which affects the most vulnerable people. And the same applies with the vaccines. Uh, vaccines are a clear indicator of inequalities which exist in the world, major inequalities which are exist in the world. So hence the proposal that we have put forward from this groups that uh, operate in Argentina. Uh, we have to think in terms of a common health, which would be guaranteed to all the citizens of the world. It might sound an utopia, as if it were an, an utopia, but we could think in terms of a specific objective, that is that all the people that live on earth might have the same access to health care. I think it's a, a, something which goes hand in hand with the eradication of poverty as a goal. Well, our region here in Argentina is a region where all the healthcare systems are de devastated. We have no beds available. We're going to go back to lockdown and there will be quarantine, absolute quarantine for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, well, most of all, uh, this happens because we have no access to vaccines in uh, Argentina, but in most of Latin America and uh, South America, we have no access to vaccines. So. Our proposal as chair that deals with water and water problems as the uh, Argentinian representatives of the Agora of the inhabitants of Earth, on Earth, we propose that we have to think in terms of a common health care, public health care. All the people that live on Earth must have access to public health care through bodies that we can trust to achieve this goal. Uh, sorry for my Spanish. So I won't, I won't be uh, carrying on with that. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio, and thank uh, Anibal for emphasizing once again 
the utopia of a common good uh, on a world level, which is that of health, uh, something which must be implemented, while the purpose of a utopia is to be translated into reality in the course of time. Can I ask Roberto Savio now if he's available? <laughs> Roberto Savio is a journalist. He, more than 40 years ago, he founded Interpresso, one of uh, the free media and independent media that was more, most extraordinary. And since a few years, he has founded a new uh, press uh, agencies called Other News, and uh, we really wish to thank him for his contribution to political activism. Thank you. I will be speaking Italian because I feel that sometimes Italian is becoming a de dead language. I, on the basis of the last two speakers, uh, I have a couple of reflections to share with you. Number one, I believe that this system can no longer resolve uh, the challenges it has to face. It is not a problem, a matter of at which stage of capitalism or of neoliberalism are we. We are. We know that uh, if, in the case of the pandemic, we know that if people in the world do not get vaccinated, we will keep on being exposed to the pandemic. But on the other hand, the system is degrading because international cooperation requires common values. Now, since 1989, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the values on which international cooperation was founded, uh, social justice, solidarity, all these values were erased. And now we lack common values to base our common work upon. So the problem, uh, that is the problem. We can, uh, okay, the, Ricardo has mentioned the so-called diplomacy of healthcare. But what's the problem? Once again, we are facing a total division between the north and the south of the world. When the promoters of the debate on um, uh, a TRIPS waiver, and the promoters being South Africa and India, the first reaction of the North was no, because that's against the principle of uh, private property. Now we have more than 100 106 countries are supporting um, South Africa's uh, position, but they are all countries from the south of the world. No northern country has taken up this position. Now, we are well aware of the fact that we Europeans are schizophrenic. We are European citizens, and that's a union project, a project based upon an idea of integration and peace, no more wars between France and Germany, and so far and so forth. But we, all, but we also are members of the NATO, and NATO is a war project. NATO is now saying that it is opening up to China. Now, this situation is a situation that ceases entering a second Cold War, completely different from the first Cold War. But this Cold War between the West and China is very visible already. And we have mavericks uh, such as Putin and Erdogan. And, but Basically, it is a clash between China and the West. 
and Europe is disappearing in all this because we are automatically following the US in their position. Now, the question is, in such a world, in today's world, could we found today the United Nations? I do not think so. Could we pass the Declaration on Human Rights? I do not think so. And the idea uh, the G20 is supposed to be a place where to find a compromise, but which compromise is possible if every country is against one another, what is, is against the other? Now, I think that uh, um, given the fact that vaccines are uh, uh, circulating slowly around the world, uh, this will cause a situation where new variants will be able to emerge and uh, uh, the current vaccines won't be enough and Big Pharma will be able to come up with new vaccines. Thank you. Well, thanks to you, not very encouraging, but that's the situation. Now they tell me that Luis Infanti has joined us. Yes, I'm with you. Good morning, dear Bishop. Good morning to you all. Please, the floor is yours. Shall I, shall I speak? Yes, it's your turn to take the floor. Well then, thank you and my warm greetings to all participants. It is a pleasure to meet you all again. I would just like to say that we cannot live a healthy life in a sick world. And the world is getting sicker and sicker every day because of us, uh, because of our fires, of the storms, of the floodings, of the nuclear tests. Uh, we are contaminating waters and the air and the land. And so we can say that we are waging war against the planet and the peoples of the planet included and their history included. We are bombing our country, our planet. A Brazilian Bishop Elder Camara said years ago that we are launching the age bomb, age for hambre, for hunger, and the P bomb, the poverty bomb. And nowadays, the V bomb, the virus bomb. The current virus and the ones that will follow, the viruses that will follow in the future. So we need to be aware that these bombs are affecting the entire planet and the whole of humanity. We need to see the causes, but also we need to be aware to see the injured and the dead and all the death that these bombs are causing. And we have a responsibility over the launching on these bombs that are destroying life. Now, there are some answers we can come up with, such as vaccines, vaccines to contrast the virus, and vaccines that are reflecting the private property of pharmaceutical world companies. And here I would like to call, quote Pope Francis, who says, on every private property, there is always a social pr price to pay. Private property is important, but in the face of social emergencies, private property should not be considered. So I believe that it will be essential for us to be there in each and every possible fora where we can insist 
on the necessity of such a humanitarian presence, one that does not discriminate against the peoples uh, that are more weak or the social groups that are weaker. I, this is what I would like to emphasize. We cannot be treat equally vaccines as we cannot consider vaccines to be goods. Uh, vaccines are not goods, they're not assets, uh, they, and uh, we should uh, really appeal to a sense of humanity in each and every possible arena, even though we see how world uh, for uh, are weak, we see that the United Nations are too weak um, uh, to speak out. I believe that certain international bodies are not strong as they should be. And so only social pressure will be able to produce a certain results. In Chile, we've had elections over just this week, and the social pressure has forced important changes. We have seen this with water here in Patagonia. Social pressure made it possible to change things. With vaccines, I believe that we need to act with the same sense of urgency because we need to put pressure on local authorities, international bodies. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. And then during the second session, we can uh, go back to specific proposals at the world level. And I would now leave the floor to Nina Sankari from Poland. She is a feminist activist, and we can, uh, and it's important to have a contribution on uh, women in the pandemic era and in Poland in particular. Nina, are you with us? Nina Sankari? Yes, here I am. I'd like to say hello to everyone. I'm not fully prepared uh, to talk about this topic uh, from the perspective of the pandemic. Sorry, I forgot to say that you come from Poland. First of all, I'd like to say that we don't have to be live in India to feel as pariah. Paria. In Poland, last March, we've had the mortality rate, which was higher than that of India. Nine point two was the indicator for mortality, which has uh, made us uh, uh, second in the European Union and second after Brazil. Uh, we're certainly not proud of that or happy about that. And I'm going to explain why this happened. Our authoritarian government and kleptocratic government has manipulated the figures to project a more helpful picture. We did not have a very high level of contagion, but we had a very high level of mortality. So with this level of mortality at the heart, the heart of Europe, we were a country that was not equipped with ways and means of being protected. Our medical system and healthcare system wasn't at all prepared to address the pandemic. All that they were able to do was to sort of uh, uh, manipulate the figures and uh, uh, 
well, they they showed that the highest level of infection or contagion at 30,000 per year, whilst uh, there were much higher number of people uh, dying for the virus. Uh, so the two figures did not tally. Yet uh, our government uh, has uh, has not adopted uh, speci specifically restrictions uh, with respect to the uh, church. Well, people could go to mass and they got contagion and infections when they were to together. And the answer when we asked why that happened, they said, well, you can't get contagion in, when you go to mass because uh, you're protected by God. Well, so I'll go back to that uh, later on. But of course, this was a very sort of useful means of uh, doing away with the protest of women. You don't be to be in Africa to find yourselves in a situation when you cannot produce the vaccine. Even though we do have industrial capabilities, we do have a, a pharmaceutical industry. And there is a level of know-how about that in Poland. So why is this happening? Well, because uh, the government feels that you can't compete with big pharma. Uh, let me now go back to question uh, the question of ignorance. If when you are in the church, uh, you hear people saying you can't be infected in a, in a place which is the home of God. Well, this is the uh, result of a a very low level of uh, education, uh, which is uh, provided uh, to the people. And uh, uh, well, the, in Poland, you have more catechism classes than other classes uh, of mathematics and chemistry and biology. So people are, ignorant as a result of that. So 30% of our people refuses to get the vaccine, to take the vaccine. So 30% of our own people, they do not trust, have no trust whatsoever in, in the government. They feel they have been betrayed by the government. And there are all sorts of conspiracy theories which should arise as a result of ignorance. Uh, and that is widespread in our society. Now, let me talk about the pandemic uh, and, and how the pandemic was being used in Poland uh, to you have a minute, just one minute, to uh, was used, uh, the pandemic was used to style stifle the protest against the, the uh, against the, the ban on abortion so we have to stick to the timing we have um, said uh, madam Jan Gashova, former minister of health in rwanda she's a medical doctor She's a medical doctor. 
So she has an extraordinary experience, uh, not just uh, for his own, for her own continent and and her uh, her country, but in terms of analyzing the problems of healthcare at worldwide level. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Ricardo. Yes, the pleasure to participate to this. Uh, dialogue. I'd like to share with you the experience of my own country, Rwanda, a country which was destroyed by genocide, uh, which killed more than 20 million of people, including healthcare professionals. Our system was destroyed and devastated. All the infrastructure were destroyed. So Rwanda is a country which had to sort of rise up from a very low level uh, after such a devastation. A country has uh, chosen to focus on the community, on the citizens after 94, the authorities of my country choose to provide community-based services. We do have the community health care operators uh, that have been trained at a local level to meet the, the urgent emergency situations, which were most urgent in the country. Uh, epidemics, uh, poor hygiene. So we have uh, trained uh, such uh, operators of community health. Uh, and over time, we have increased uh, the number of people that have been trained. Uh, we have uh, 60,000 such uh, agents of community health care uh, in, uh, in my country. Uh, we also have small clinics uh, which uh, cater to 1,000 families. So primary health care is good. They're, they can sort of uh, make home visits uh, to women who have just um, uh, born their child. And, and uh, this is happening at the level of the village. And we have been able to sort of create a very high level of, of trust between the people that are uh, working with the community who have been trained by the doctors and are in a position to respond to the basic needs of the community. Uh, Rwanda has seen uh, an increase uh, in terms of the uh, coverage of with vaccines. We have 90% um, of women that um, have childbirth in the hospitals. So I wanted to stress that it's important to educate the people, and it's also extremely important to decentralize healthcare services. During the Ebola crisis, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we could uh, contain these epidemics and we were not affected by Ebola, Ebola in uh, Rwanda, thanks to the collaboration which is rooted in our culture and, and the stakeholders uh, of the healthcare sector, the security, bodies, the private sector, civil society, and all the partners in operating in Rwanda. There is an excellent collaboration. The other important element which can explain the success of our healthcare system in Rwanda is the fact that each leader signs a specific contract for the performance uh, with his, uh, with a higher level. Uh, so we have set uh, precise goals. Uh, we have global policies uh, like the, uh, the global policies, the strategy for the transformation of the Rwanda society at the level of the world uh, uh, objectives. Uh, 
Et donc, euh, je pense qu'il y a des mouvements. Et je pense que, can you hear me? There is an echo. Yes, we can hear some other voices. So we go by very specific monitoring processes. I'd like to mention also the our, uh, access to funding. Well, we have uh, a body which uh, co provides uh, health care coverage for the population, for the whole population. So I'd like to say that the collaboration between our neighboring countries uh, is improving. But it's extremely important that we do improve our collaboration because uh, the viruses and the diseases uh, know no borders. And the, this was the experience I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Thank you for emphasizing the achievements that, that you were able to attain in your, in your country and uh, so, and improve your position. Uh, at worldwide levels. So we now have uh, Moena Bizet. Sorry. Pietro is not connected with us. Okay, so let's uh, break. So we go back to Brussels uh, where there is a demonstration. Here I am, Roberto Pizzuti, he is an Italian comedian who lives in Brussels. Here we are, we are on the stairs of the Justice Palace of Brussels, where we have put these ropes. Uh, because uh, Ricardo said that this is the day when we should express our outrage and our determination for a different humanity. And this is what we wish all inhabitants of the world today. As uh, you, can, you can hear to the voices of those speaking, we chanted, we danced, we put these ropes to say that we should uh, uh, celebrate uh, the primacy of universal public goods, uh, health number one. We want humankind to be a real political subject, an institutional subject, a key player in the decisions concerning uh, the how to regulate the world and its future. We want to abolish the patents on vaccines. We do not accept the predatory nature of intellectual property uh, that says that we should pay uh, we should give money to those uh, who are developing goods that are in the collective interest. You can hear people clapping hands. And we have to insist on the fact that the financial system to serve the needs of the people of the world and not the other way around. And uh, we want to say that 2020 was uh, the year of the pandemic is also the moment when we start a process of change that outlaws uh, predatory and speculative uh, finance from Brussels for a social for a real social justice for humankind. Thank you, Roberto, and uh, have a good mobility. Realization. I am glad that the sun is shining. Yes, look at the sun. And the Justice Palace in Brussels is the uh, biggest neo 
classico building in the world. Um, Brussels wanted to hit a record there and they built the biggest justice palace in the world and uh, you can see the stairs uh, leading to the palace from the Marron neighborhood. It is very significant to be there. And as you can see in the picture, uh, there was also somebody wearing a black coat, and that's Bernard Tissio, who's one of the richest writers in Belgium, rich in analysis, rich in ideas. He wrote a beautiful novel, um, and it's important that he participates in the man mobilization. Uh, so thank you to all the participants to the initiative. Thanks to you, and see you soon. And now let's go back to Noema Vizer from Brazil. She's a writer, and she's also well known in Brazil because she uh, for, for um, speaking out in support of the feminist movement. Moema. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. We have already had quite a few interventions, uh, and many of the things that were said on the vaccines I agree with. Unfortunately, my country, Brazil, has become an example of all that a pandemic situation can determine in, uh, in a situation of social inequality. I, think that just as those who spoke before me said that we are forced at the moment to work at two levels. On the one hand, the vaccine issue, which is the urgent one at the global level. But in the meantime, we need to think of what is it that we want? I think it was Nina who said that uh, certain countries would have had the possibility to come up with vaccines, but uh, this sort of war between pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, that has caused problems. I wonder why also within our group we do not discuss more of what is happening in Cuba. Perhaps we should start from that experience and uh, demand that uh, more of those vaccines are produced. I, I'm a social educator. And uh, if I think of the current situation, of the impossibility to uh, have to come up at the global level with a new way of living. And that made me think of the experience we've had in my country, uh, and which is something that should exist at the world level, which is what we call the SUS, the uh, single health system. Which should certainly, unquestionably, 
be a system that forces us to think of how we can reverse the economy that dominates the organization of human life and of society. And also, as the Earth Charter told us, the point is that economy, we should create a solution where economy goes back to serving life, to being at the service of life. And the issue of health is completely a part of this discourse, as Luis Infanti and also Nibel said. We cannot speak of human rights if you, if you don't have a right to fresh water or to, if you don't have the right to breathe. Uh, because all the forests are being destroyed, as happens in Brazil, or if you cannot eat because the food is all poisoned. And uh, rather than feeding things that have to do with our health, for example, in Brazil, there's this major problem with the agrotoxic, um, with agrotoxic food. So if the uh, saying that the economy should be at the service of life uh, is something that should be translated into very practical things. And if I think of SUS as the as a universal health service, we go back to what was already mentioned. Um, health systems uh, are at times uh, uh, systems that are only conceived to tackle um, diseases, whereas we should think of a universal health system more based on prevention than on treating illnesses and diseases. And this means reversing the way we conceive health also in terms of interculturality. Um, well, think of the contribution of Western science, but also of the systems that exist at the more ancestral level. If we think of a universal system, we have to take these aspects into consideration. We need to think of a system that goes from global to local, or to lo from local to global, and this should be a priority for international cooperation, as uh, Lili and others have said, because illegality, the illegality that exists is not natural, is something that was produced by countries. And uh, also we have a system that of the United Nations, that totally depends on big corporations. So when we think of a universal health system, that is what we have in mind. Thank you. Well, you totally stick to your time. Thank you very much. I think that what you said is very important on this point on the universal health system and the idea that uh, health is, uh, um, should not be only be conceived in terms of treating diseases. And from this, and on this point, I would leave the floor uh, to the next speaker who uh, um, has a lot of things to say on this point. Uh, also thanks to his previous struggles, also on a water in France and in, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, and he would like to say a few words on the medical strategy. Um, Jean-Pierre, you're welcome. Oui, uh, bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ricardo, for 
this meeting on a topic which is of fundamental importance uh, to build a different world. I'd like to emphasize something which I have appreciated especially. It's a message that you don't hear very often. Uh, you often uh, consider that Africa is, uh, is dependent on others, but we, it was very inspiring what our um, uh, colleague from Rwanda told us uh, uh, about decentralization. We shouldn't be trying to teach a lesson to others, but we could learn a lesson from other people that have done very good things. It was a very interesting and inspiring uh, speech. Solidarity should not exist only as a function of problems which are very close to us. During the health care crisis, Mais depuis longtemps, nous devrions tous... We were able to sort of mobilize but, uh, for the health care, but we should be mobilized uh, with respect to um, uh, climate uh, crisis and disasters. There should be the possibility of uh, becoming aware of a number of conditions that we do not uh, share with other parts of the world. So it's a a word which is unacceptable. We were not aware of it, but this is going to be a source of great concern for us. Well, there, well, there are billions of people that live in the poor countries are suffering from very plain diseases because they lack the financial needs to deal with those. So these are they die of peritonitis, they die of malaria, and uh, they, they have no access to drinking water. International community has the means of uh, putting an end to these unacceptable inequalities. Uh, we simply focus on coronavirus but because that we are concerned with that. But where is international? Solidarity. Well, the dire conditions where millions of human beings are living are the results of our economy. People are not poor because of their destiny or by chance. Over 90% of the humanity must be content with less than 10% of the goods, word goods, because everything is governed by a word finance system which has uh, financiarized all forms of, uh, of life to benefit to the richest people. At the level of primary health care, uh, we should uh, focus on it. Uh, to, there would be a way of uh, try to encompass the uh, migration flows. Uh, well, uh, often the people who are in power use author authoritarian uh, measures uh, removed uh, from the forum of citizens uh, to ensure to, to avoid uh, having to do with uh, local communities and their competencies. The medical facilities should be more open to dialogue in such countries. During the healthcare crisis, the lockdown was not the result of a democratic decision. There are many collateral damages which will stem from that. There were conditions which have been diagnosed too late. The COVID crisis has increased the surveillance, the control of personal data, geolocation of uh, our movements. Uh, the political leaders have imposed this form of lockdown as an ideal treatment of the current crisis. It's a model which is based on uncertain hypotheses. Well, it, and they have a, enabled countries uh, to pursue uh, their economic uh, interest. Well, the, this is something which is going to affect mostly the poorest people. 
and it might result into an end of social life. People are inward looking, uh, they want to protect their borders and are frightened by everything. So, so we are deprived of our uh, possibility of uh, interacting with other people at social level. Our health depends on many such factors. Science is not a, an absolute truth. And since uh, democracy is based on the discussion of ideas, and uh, sciences operate on the basis of arguments which are put forward. Scientists have uh, supported different views, uh, conflicting views. So we must be aware of those that profess an, an absol absolute truth. There are many scientists that are very dogmatic. We must uh, sort of consider that life is of a temporary nature, So, and science doesn't have answers to this. We have to take on board uh, philosophy between the, with the other scientific disciplines. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, this uh, interesting remarks. Uh, the fact that we have to open up to a global vision of a problem. I'll give the floor to Roberto Musacchio to give us uh, remarks on the theme of uh, mobilization of uh, citizens. And then we'll ask Alain Samba to take the floor before we try to get connected with another demonstration which is taking place in Liège. Roberto. Roberto, you have the floor. Roberto. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Just a few infos to start in Italy. On Friday and Saturday, we'll have two mobilization days on the G20. That's important because the G8 was held in Italy and, of course, being uh, in a being able to mobilize is important. Of course, mobilizations will not be comparable to those that happened back in the times of the G8 in Genoa, because uh, it's a different uh, uh, situation that we find ourselves in when it comes to uh, the capacity to mobilize. Now, when it comes to the European Citizens Initiative, this is uh, in our country, we have been collecting many signatures uh, most signatures have been collected in Italy and the, with a wide network uh, that uh, is inclusive of many different organizations and also of trade unions. And that's important because we speak of a citizen struggle because it is va and universal values that are at stake. But the situation where we have a situation patent plus trade is something that is trying to dominate entirely the world. And at the global level, there would already be, we would have a capacity to produce and, and distribute, et cetera, uh, those, um, uh, to, to produce the vaccines at the global level because the, this economic sector is already organized globally. Yet the um, coupling between trade and uh, patent create the current scarcity. Now, the question is, uh, can also workers um, be activated, given that workers are hit by the pandemic as citizens, but also as working people and as producers, uh, as the ones? Uh, um, this topic of how we can transform this struggle also in a general um, struggle against our production model. Uh, this is something that we should discuss, in my opinion, together with this world dimension that we have mentioned in the various uh, uh, interventions, uh, um, 
uh, the, the uh, speaker from Rwanda has given us interesting insight about the situation in Africa and many other international uh, interesting contributions, but um, we should recreate something similar to what we had with the, with the World Social Forum that um, uh, was uh, hit by uh, repression at many levels, and after all that, the pandemic arrived. Well, yes, thank you, Roberto, for reminding us that uh, uh, one of the things we cannot accept is the fact that at the world level, the organization where the matters concerning health are being discussed and decided is not the World Health Organization, but the World Trade Organization. And this confirms how strong this matching between uh, trade and patents is also when it comes to the production of uh, health products. I would now leave the floor to Alassane Ba. Alassane Ba lives in France. I was introducing you. And I will uh, get rid of my microphone because I'm afraid it's not working. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Roberto. Can you hear me? Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very, very much. I would like to thank Jean, the uh, Diane, the former health minister in Rwanda, who accepted to be with us despite the uh, situation. So thank you, Diane. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, everyone knows that today Rwanda is essential to... It's a country that shows more than any other country what can be achieved and accomplished in Africa. So thank you so much for telling us your experience and what you were able to accomplish. So, so I want to thank also somebody who's not here. Someone who has been working everywhere in the world who is, is unable to be here because today in Paris, uh, oh, there is a summit meeting of the French speaking African countries. So thank you so much for calling this um, dialogue, uh, public power, civil society, when they are united, they can achieve something. I thank uh, Jean-Pierre. I'm from Senegal, but we're together from Auvergne. Uh, I know that I only have very few minutes to make my remarks. So, but if we all work together, we can achieve something. Thank you for, the, for your comments, for your remarks, uh, showing that we can we cannot simply think in terms of a, a political, a frankly, a human approach. I, I love you all because we have a common uh, goal. Uh, Jean-Pierre can bear witness to that. Let me go back to the vaccine in Africa, to vaccines in Africa. Uh, uh, there are many people who are at the, the higher 
in a higher position to talk about uh, vaccines in, in Africa and in Rwanda. They, but I'd like to say something anyway on the vaccines. Uh, Joe Biden announced uh, that there won't be any more patents. And, and that is something which was, uh, sorry, we can't hear, we can't hear. Uh, we, we, we don't have, we are, we are connected with the demonstration in Liège. Uh, you'll take the floor later on. The uh, trips uh, um, agreement uh, cover uh, property, intellectual property rights, but we do not have in Africa the capability of uh, manufacturing vaccine. Either we have a sort of freedom of uh, production for vaccine, but we do not have, but in terms of international healthcare democracy, we should share the same values. Uh, and you, you know yourselves, uh, many Africans that work at the international level. But in the villages in Africa, there are people who do not speak French or any other language and don't know a thing about vaccines. Uh, in the framework of COVAX, uh, uh, we, we do have vaccines that reach the capital cities. There is also other project of the African Union, the AVAX project, African vaccines projects. And this is something which is based on money given from the African countries uh, to respond to the needs of society. So uh, we, we have to respond to these needs of the young people, the women, and, uh, and, and other parts of society. Unfortunately, however, what happens is that uh, what whatever is available to, to help uh, the people in the country uh, is not available for people living in villages, remote villages, which are difficult to attain. Uh, that is a sort of network that was mentioned by uh, Ricardo and other people. That there should be one condition that we should bear in mind. Our countries in Africa must have uh, uh, production capabilities. Uh, I, have, uh, I have not attended a meeting with the Center for Disease Control in Africa, but uh, we need to have, uh, we have to, to, to have uh, two possibilities. Uh, the TRIPS uh, agreements uh, on intellectual property rights, uh, so that uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Senegal cannot uh, manufacture pills uh, and uh, injectable uh, medicines. Rwanda and Nigeria can do that. Then we have to have a temporary licenses. Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson and Johnson could retain their licenses, but they should suspend the licenses temporarily to enable Africa to produce vaccines. With many colleagues, Italian and others, all the colleagues, from Africa that are working at the international level are fighting to ensure that uh, people understand that in the villages, there is no water available and there is no way of reaching out to these people.
Je vous aime tous. J'aime Ricardo, j'aime Jean-Pierre, je t'aime Diane. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire ensemble? Attends, là. We are together. Sorry, we are in contact with. Yes. Roberto, can you put us in contact with Yes? Voilà, Catherine. Diane, you have the floor. Bonjour. Oui. Hello. So, how's the mobilization going? Well, it just ended. It went very well. Well, are those the, 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 the stairs you climbed? Yes, we climbed them all. Wonderful. Uh, there were about 50 of us from different uh, associations and different political forces. Well, not all the political forces, but uh, quite a few. And so we climbed those stairs because uh, that is the symbol uniting uh, um, the, the municipality and the public hospital of the city. And that is why we climbed um, to the top. And, and did you sing, did you write, did you read a text? We, um, uh, we, we, in, in order to represent uh, the need, uh, we, 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 we claimed a public uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry at the, at the European and uh, world level and the right to access vaccines. So we also had uh, placards with us. And more about 50 placards. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Catherine. And so, and I see that also in Liège, you were protected from the rain. Yes, no rain at all. Christine Bagnol is also with us, but uh, she was with us, but unfortunately she had to leave now. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we can continue with our chat. And uh, thanks a lot. See you soon. And now we can go back to Alassane. And I would then uh, propose that we take a three or four minutes break and then we shift to the second part of the meeting uh, that concerning proposals. And so after Alassane, we will, there we go. So after Alassam, uh, we will ask uh, Cordelia Hildebrand the, uh, to um, reopen the second part, and then we'll have Bark Botenga, Armando De Negri, and so forth and so forth. So Alassam, you can uh, finish your talk. Sorry for the interruption, but it was important uh, to see, to show, the various actions that we can come up with. Yes, you know, Ricardo, that I uh, cannot talk if Diana is uh, not talking because it was me who asked her to participate. She's done so much for Africa, for Rwanda, and um, after Diane, I've, I've, I've had exchanges with so many others. Uh, and Diane 
allows it, I would be happy that she speaks on my behalf too. She uh, can say, uh, say it all about uh, how to come up with a democratic healthcare system in Africa, what healthcare independence looks like. And I am so honored that she's with us and she can well cover all uh, these topics and she can clearly express a vision of what healthcare and what health in Africa is and means. Thank you very much. So now we will take a very short break. We've been connected for more than two hours. And so perhaps just a few minutes, two or three minutes silence. And I would ask uh, Roberto Morea uh, what do you, we should do technically, if we can just uh, take a brief break uh, and everyone can have a coffee or... But after that, uh, we will ask uh, all the various speakers to take the floor again uh, and on propositions. That sounds wonderful. Thanks, Ricardo. See you again in uh, three minutes. Bene, riposarci un po', eh. Ricardo, io ho bisogno di uscire in 20 minuti. Armando, tu poi devi andare via tra 20 minuti? Sì. Ah. Eh, Riccardo, se coggi... Sì. Devi partire? Armando deve lasciarci tra 20 minuti, magari lo ah, mettiamo... Va bene, a... lui è, deve intervenire Armando dopo Cornelia e Marco Potenga, e se Armando dopo. Perfetto. Quindi ce la fa, perché ora è 4 minuti ciascuno, quindi... Eh, Perfetto. Ti, ti ha compreso Armando? Sì, se abbiamo compreso. Sai, là per tu, se tu attendi ancora 15 minuti, 16 minuti, Je, je pense, oui, je pense, merci. C'est parfait? Bon, bien. Merci. Obrigado, obrigado. C'est Roberto, pensi di cominciare? Passate i tre minuti? Eh, aspettiamo che rientri Cornelia. Sì, Cornelia è di nuovo lì? Yes, I, no. I can hear you. Ok, okay Cornelia, very thanks. Uh, I, I, I want to make a three short uh, proposal and Great. I have, and I have two, two questions, is it ok? Okay, right. Good. But maybe not Go only... ahead now. But maybe not only three minutes, maybe four minutes. Four minutes, it's okay. So you, I think we can start again. And thanks again. And we give the floor to Cornelia Idevan, co-president of Transform Europe. Cornelia, the floor is yours. Okay. 
Uh, I want to come back to the uh, initiative, European Citizen, European Citizen Initiative, under the slogan Right to Cure. And I think uh, this initiative we should push forward and we use more European motivation for, for that. I see the problem, include my own party, the link in Germany, that we have especially come concerning the national electoral campaigning, the strong national orientation of our policy. But we have to find ways, stronger ways for the European initiatives. I think this initiative- four minutes, huh? Yeah. The second point, the second point is, uh, the the process or the uh, the the process of the future of Europe. I think this process, the future of Europe, we always discuss, and also the people, the ruling class, the ruling uh, represents of Europe. What is the role of Europe in this time? And most they discuss it connected with the question of militarization and with the question of migration, with the question of Frontex and so on. But the richest project in Europe was the welfare state of Europe. And the new role for, for Europe could be also the welfare state in connection in which way we can translate it on the global level. That means what I propose you is to bring such discussion in the process of the future of Europe, to bring the voice, the global voice from the left wings to the question of the healthcare sector uh, in the new reformed way in this debate. Also to bring this voice in this debate. And the third proposal from my side is, we have the European Forum every year and we should include our comrades from today in this European meeting for a big uh, panel to this question, the health question and the global sol solidarity. What is the concrete project today? That my three proposal. And so I have three questions. The first one is, I know uh, Mark Botenga is speaking after me. And so I have the question to him, not only to him, but also for him. Uh, you give us a lot of information about what is going on in the healthcare system. Is it possible to organize an, a new quality of exchange and the publication of all such informations? Is it possible to bring this, uh, the way of the money from the public investment to the private corona profit? in the public sphere. And my second question is to, uh, is connected with the World Social Forum. I had a good experience with the World Social Forum. Is it possible to reorganize concerning the health question, a kind of global action day for all of us? That are my proposals. Great. Great. Many, Many thanks. thanks. Uh, now I think <laughs> lupus in fabula uh, is uh, Mark Botenga who has the four minutes of uh, proposals. Please, Mark. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll, I'll do it in English then. Um, listen, uh, maybe maybe to start then with the the the, the suggestion made by uh, by Cornelia. Um, is it, is it possible to, to bring these things or keep these um, pharmaceutical products in the public domain? Yes. Um, it is even not that weird. Uh, if you look at the, um, the program, the European Space Program, so you know there's a new program for the European Space. Actually, if you read that, um, the intellectual property rights are maintained within uh, with the European Commission meaning that uh, there is there a clear connection between uh, the public investment on the one hand, public investment in research development, and on the other hand, the output remaining, uh, let's say, public property. Um, now, this is different, for example, in the European Defence Fund. So the European Defence Fund does gives a lot of money to uh, weapons uh, producers and, and multinationals. 
but also gives them the intellectual property rights on the products. Um, so basically, the model they're using today for vaccines is closer to weapons than it is to a public service. Uh, is it possible? Yes, uh, you can use the, the Horizon Europe program and, and, uh, and ask for these, um, these conditions, either to keep them in the public domain as open source or uh, to retain the intellectual property rights um, with the European Commission or the member states, whoever uh, funds it. So yes, this is possible. Um, it is also possible today to uh, basically lift uh, the patents through the World Trade Organization. Uh, the proposal I mentioned it earlier, the proposal that is on the table um, by uh, carried by the, the India and South Africa and a number of other countries. So this is, a, is an option. And of course, the European Union can unilaterally act. Um, but mainly the problem is today that the European Union is blocking. So the European Union is the one blocking at, at the global level, really, uh, on this on this point. Uh, all of this exists. Um, so all of these tools are there, um, even to do the technology transfer. So I, I always insist on this. It's not a technical problem. The problem is political. Um, if you look at the, um, the platforms at the World Health Organization for sharing technology, be it the coronavirus technology access pool, be it the, the new technology transfer for mRNA vaccines, all of these, how would I say, technical instruments are there. So whoever says that it's a technical problem is lying. Uh, the problem is political. The problem is a matter of, of, of interests. This is why I agree, of course, that the citizens initiative is important because it increases the pressure on the European Union and the European Union today really is, um, how would I say, the most backward uh, political entity in, at this level, uh, you know, of course, with the member states. But globally, if you look uh, at, at the situation, then we can only cons uh, consider that the European Union and its member states are uh, really the retrograde uh, of, of public health today. Um, maybe one more thing um, I think that, that can be done and which is, uh, how would I say, which is important, that is that we can use the new HERA incubator, which is a new, let's say, health emergency response authority, which the European Union is developing. Um, it is now used to give a lot of money to private companies, uh, basically just giving them money and saying, do, what it, do with it something you like. Uh, we finance your production, we finance uh, your um, uh, factories and so on. We could use this tool to support technology transfers. And we could use this tool to develop uh, some kind of project like a public Airbus. You know, you know, at the time Airbus, when it was uh, created, it was a public-public cooperation. Now it has been, of course, privatized on the stock exchange and so on. But these things, these new public health authorities, you know, they could serve, they could be a real tool to create a, a public uh, health um, infrastructure, let's say, in the European Union that would help as well other countries to create production. Okay, I will stop there because my four minutes are over. But thank you very much again for, for the attention. That's perfect. Many thanks, Mark. That's perfect. And now, uh, Armando De Negri, so we maintain the promise to you that you can talk before leaving. Armando? Thank you very much. I think I, I speak in English now. I only say that uh, one of uh, the main tasks that I'd like to propose to ourselves is to repoliticize the social life. I, I think uh, this is a, a main uh, issue in order to avoid this policy that is provoking uh, and applying the concept of uh, disposable life. No? And that is finally what is uh, allowing that we have this very asymmetric access to vaccines and the other rights. So in this sense, I think I propose that we can uh, go ahead uh, following Cornelia idea is we can propose our, our, a day, a struggle day through the World Social Forum, through the, the other organizations in order to put on perspective uh, a world uh, mobilization that promote the right to health uh, through the universal access to vaccines uh, in universal health and social protection systems. You know? Because I think, uh, and uh, this is a concern I have, sometimes I, I feel that we are reducing the debate uh, in vaccines. 
when in fact, uh, uh, even if we have universal access to vaccines, the problem behind that is the complexity of the social needs on health that need to be faced by a very complex and important uh, social protection, including health and social protection systems. No? So in this sense, I think it could be a very important move to follow the, the idea of the memorandum that we are launching today. And um, I think uh, particularly uh, insist in the idea that we need to, to support the elaboration of the, the national policies on health and social protection in order to make pressure on the regional spaces and on the global space. Every day we have opportunities, as now with the election of the new constitutional uh, uh, assembly in Chile, we have the opportunity to promote a different system. Now we have the opportunity to decolonize the way we see social policies, because social policies now are very much dominant. And uh, they are not dealing with the possibility to consider that the social protection systems are a very important uh, strategy to go ahead with a new development perspective and to, to face the deep and deep inequalities we have after these very uh, severe pandemic uh, effects. So in this sense, I think the, the manifesto is uh, for the uh, the memorandum today is large enough to uh, to house no or to shelter this kind of initiative and could be very strategical being part of broader coalitions where we can promote this kind of uh, initiative. So I, I'll be very glad through the World Social Forum Health and Social Security to, to shelter this kind of a proposal and to promote that among the World Social Forum uh, communities. and. Uh, particularly to see how can we support political laboratories in countries and regions to promote a reflection and action around the, the alternatives we need to propose from each country reality towards a global uh, governance on citizenship. So that's, that's the idea. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Armando, who uses this concept of uh, decolonized. Great, I will come back to it later. And then uh, have a nice end of the day, Armando. And then I would ask uh, Lilia Ganem and then Nina Sankari before Jean-Pierre Wauquiez uh, to say some words on proposals in each in four minutes. Please, Lilia. Donc, uh... <clears throat> Les propositions, uh, que... Les proposals which I'd like to put forward are basically the, the claims which are put forward by more social movements in the Arab countries. The most important one has to do with the vaccines that should not be viewed as uh, goods uh, and ensure that there would be local production of vaccines. Uh, uh, all the countries uh, that have followed these issues have seen uh, that the uh, pharmaceutical industry was de destroyed. Uh, uh, the, 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 we have like 300 people that are piled up in, in a small air space. Uh, without the necessary uh, facilities. Well, it, uh, we have also had many casualties amongst the uh, medical personnel. Uh, the other important issue is uh, the following. Uh, we are countries that have been affected by a great many wars. So let's uh, have a sort of a call a lull in this uh, permanent state of war. Uh, so, well, there must be a time uh, like it was during the Middle Ages when you can exchange prisoners and uh, sort of uh, give some uh, respite to the people engaged in war. Um, I think that it, uh, economic sanctions are very serious because they are a kind of soft war, waging a soft war. So we have uh, to 
draft a human charter for the right of life to health and water. And I think it's something which would be extremely relevant for the Middle, Middle East. We have 74 million in the Arab people in the Arab countries that have no access to drinkable water. So 31 million in the Sudan, 14.9 in Yemen, and 9.9 million in Egypt. Well, they lack drinking water. Well, they don't have water that they can use. So it's important to connect the question of health and water to the question of life. So it would be like a sort of envisaging a human charter and stop sanctions, terminate sanctions when it comes to sanctions which affect the uh, the people who are ill, the health sector. I also mentioned international aid. Let me uh, recall that there are 28 million people in Yemen that depend on international aid. There are many amongst them that do not uh, reach uh, such aid. So, we have to find ways of helping that uh, country. Well, that it's the poorest uh, people in the world that it is, is basically caught in the war for petrodollars. Uh, and that's very unfair. So we have to make a tremendous effort to deal with that. The last point I'd like to make to encourage and value and uh, local experiences. Uh, well, it would be good if we could uh, sort of devise a, a special website when we can show the local experiences. We can talk about water in the Middle East. Uh, we have created a, a system of interdependence between the various populations, which was very effective. Uh, we, we are really in dire need of doing this. So I was very happy to take part in this discussion. Thank you very much, Doctor, and thanks to everyone. Thank you for your proposals. Now, Nina Sankeri. If you want to come back to some of the points which were raised. Nina, she's not there. Is she there? Yes. Micro. Microphone, please. You have to. Okay, ça va. To use your microphone. Fine. Fine. I'd like to give my four minutes to somebody else who's better better prepared to share some proposals because I'm not prepared for that. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for your being very generous. Donc, merci, Nina. Alors, so thank you, Nina. Jean-Pierre, four minutes for your proposals. This health crisis leads us to, to think about it. Multifactorial health should not be simply considered from the uh, medical standpoint. For a proper health status, all the, all the components of our body should work um, harmoniously. Well, for the earth is the same, all the elements are equally important. Health, education, and other common goods must be harmoniously uh, working together. Globalization that we witness should, should integrate the common uh, destiny for all the human beings in must include uh, 
solidarity amongst the peoples uh, and um, to face up to the global issues uh, for the planet. Otherwise, uh, the various countries will be inward looking, uh, will not uh, help their fellow man. So we have to try and share what is the best of cultures. And we have a sort of an economy that might generate laws which are meant to meet general interests. The crisis showed us to what extent our democracy is sick. The notion of common goods, public goods, is important to give rise to an authentic democracy, which is based on not on quorum, but the discussion of ideas to do away with the pyramid-like hierarchical system. Uh, and autocracy is the expression of uh, selfish um, egos. Uh, we have to uh, consider this uh, new approach for a more horizontal governance uh, to it, to tap the collective uh, potential. It will be the triumph of collective intelligence, uh, which is uh, promoting a proper way of life in our, on our planet. The health of our world is based on that, depends on that. Well, well education will be essential. Uh, education should prepare human beings to become competent citizens to act in for collective interests. Uh, well, the life and health should be given priority to establish a system that must uh, do away with individualism and conflicts, sharing of knowledge, interculturality, intergeneration exchanges. It would be important that we introduce philosophy since the early years, primary education. Sorry. We have to have a long memory because our older people have uh, talked about uh, sustainable development. We have to consider the time of nature to try and be in harmony with that. Our intelligence must uh, recognize the limitations of our system and we must live with that. We must be sober and the our educational system must put an end to the dogma of interspeciality. We must be aware of the fact that innovation is not always synonym of progress. The public good, common public good, uh, should be something on which we should act upon. Uh, the, that will be something that our children will in turn pass on to the planet. I have just uh, three more lines. Uh, we must uh, sort of move away from timing. Uh, we know that the solidarity, contemplation of the treasures of nature are authentic uh, values. Uh, human beings must be wise and do away with the most uh, most uh, dangerous virus. Thank you for your recommendations. Which are of a global nature. Most relevant proposals. Now I'd like to ask uh, Noema to take the floor. For, for her proposals, and then we'll ask Diane Vachumba to submit her proposal. Then there will be a high very bound. Alice, we'll take the floor. Go ahead, Moema. Are you there? No, I'm afraid she's not. Okay. 
then I would ask Jan Sumba to kindly take the floor. Voilà, magnifique. Après tout ce que notre ami Alain. Okay, Alassane. wonderful. I think that Alison has maybe exaggerated a little bit. No, he was, uh, well, his words were true. Uh, uh, the, the leadership and, and, and the, the, the health, the good health of the population is what uh, uh, the, the random leadership has in its heart. And uh, it is, and I would like to say that I think that the pandemic has taught us many lessons. I I think that it will leave important lessons, particularly when it comes to cooperation between neighboring countries. We have seen uh, um, we have seen countries that uh, share borders uh, and uh, that that uh, um, started working together to tackle malaria. And in Africa, we have really realized how it is important to come together. And the practical example is the finalization of a strategic uh, plan to contrast uh, malaria, which was validated uh, last week. I, uh, um, and that in the east of Africa and uh, west of Africa countries are doing the same thing. And that's an important programs, progress. For what concerns the local production of vaccines, I am optimistic. And our president and other heads of state, such as in South Africa and Senegal, are working to accelerate the local production of vaccines. But of course, today the problem is COVID. Tomorrow it may be something else. I think that we need that uh, resilient, uh, we need to come up with policies, resilient policies in order to respond rapidly to pandemic and prevention. Of course, we need to invest in prevention, but as others as some said, also in the education in our community. Education is critical because we need well-trained, uh, personnel, we need uh, to build up knowledge and education. Digitalization uh, can be part of the solution. It can allow uh, countries to save money and invest that money elsewhere. So uh, remote medicine and artificial intelligence, all these things are things that African countries should consider. And then also we need to define, the, every African country needs to correctly define its priorities because countries are in a different situation. And uh, some, and, 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 and it is very important for countries to be aware of what point they are at and come up with strategic plans that are up to the challenge. But also investing in industrialization, but also in medical tourism. We should uh, we, we could, for example, we know very well that there are people that travel from certain part of the Western world towards countries where certain uh, services, healthcare services are less expensive, expensive. African countries could think in those terms as well. Uh, 
So I will stop here and I really thank you very much for your passion, for all your hard work and this very interesting uh, meeting. And so thank you for inviting me to contribute to this very important conversation. I hope we will have a chance to meet again in the future. Thanks to you. Thanks for participating. And now the idea was that Heinz Bierbaum could um, speak of the propositions of the party of the European lev left. So Heinz. European is uh, the European Citizens Initiative um, Right to Cure, or otherwise called No Profit and Pandemic. I think that's a, a core activity from a European point of uh, view, and we have to make this campaign uh, in a, uh, to transform it in a success. I think that's very important to collect as a signatures, to make a political campaign, and also to, uh, I think it's also necessary to uh, collaborate with other initiatives in this direction because this, this is not only the European Citizens Initiative, there are also, also other initiatives for uh, a free and universal access to vaccine against Big Pharma. I think that's very important for us, it's a crucial campaign for us. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, we should um, transform this initiative in a general campaign for improving public services. I think that's very, very important. We have to end the neoliberal austerity policy in Europe and in favor of public investments for uh, uh, sect uh, sectors which are very important for the development for the future of society. And I think healthcare is a, a crucial sector uh, concerning public services. And therefore I suggest to transform this initiatives in a general campaign for strengthening public services. Uh, next one, the next element, next proposal concerns um, peace and disarmament. I think we should have a campaign for reducing military expenditure in favor of finance, uh, funding um, health care and public services. And therefore, we should uh, collaborate with the, movement, uh, with the peace movements on national, European, and global level. I think the, um, the question, the issue of health care is really closely linked to also to peace and disarmament. And therefore, I think we should make more efforts. Uh, and we should make a campaign to reduce military expenditure because we have the money for uh, um, financing healthcare and other LM, uh, public services. For me, very important is also uh, our collaboration. I see this conference as a starting point for strengthening our coordination and to have really a very global movement for healthcare, for ending neoliberal policy, for putting in the center welfare and the people. And therefore, I think we should uh, find ways to coordinate, uh, to, to strengthen our co collaboration and uh, for us, uh, for the European left, uh, we have some possibilities. For example, we have a very good relationship with the uh, Forum of Sao Paulo. And Co Connie Hildebrand uh, already mentioned the European Forum, uh, which could also be a possibility, an opportunity to um, uh, have a political dialogue, not only on the European level, but on the international, on the global level. And therefore, I think the outcome, the result of this conference should be that we make any effort to uh, strengthen our global coordination because we are facing global problems 
not only healthcare, also the ecological uh, challenges are global ones, and therefore we should uh, strengthen the global coordination of progressive forces of the left. And we, as European left, we are, uh, are uh, ready to um, do our best to uh, improve this global uh, collaboration and coordination. So thank you once again for on, uh, organizing this conference. I think it's really very important and I think it could be a starting point for strengthening our collaboration on a global level. Many thanks to you, Heinz. We have left for 14 minutes. I would suggest that I leave uh, uh, six, seven minutes to e to Roberto's, uh, and I just uh, take the privilege to make some comments and remarks on what I have the impression that got out from uh, our conference. Ricardo? Yes. Uh, and yes. we have to stop. Yes, no, uh, um, Luis Infanti asked for the floor, uh, I think. think yes, yes, yes. Luis. Sí, Luis. Sí, eh, gracias. Eh, volevo solo reafirmar. Thank you. I just want to reaffirm my proposal uh, um, concerning what Heinz just said. I completely agree with what Heinz said. I just wish to ask that. that it is clear from what we have discussed that the economy dominates health and life. So I believe that we should aim at the economy. And as I was saying earlier, we are constantly bombed by uh, the hunger bomb, the poverty bomb, the virus bomb, and vis-a-vis such a bombing, it would be essential to come up with a campaign that questions armed forces. Armed forces are supposed to defend three essential aspects of life, land with the army, air with the air force, and waters with the Marine forces, with the Navy. So a campaign to drastically reduce uh, arms and weapons is fundamental because we also need to identify and denounce national and multinational companies that are bombing the world by their race to arms. So I think that a campaign on this is absolutely necessary, not only to reduce illnesses and diseases, but to promote life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. I think that I can try and identify some points on the basis of this last couple of interventions that are pretty much in line with what the uh, previous speaker said. I would say that two ideas are confirmed. The first, the idea of the strategy of decolonization of life. We need to decolonize life, and there are practical measures that can be taken in that sense. We need to decolonize the production of essential uh, goods and services, the production of water, of air, seeds. That must be decolonized. And this means decolonizing 
social policies, decolonizing the policies on the relationships that the production of goods implies, decolonizing social policy um, evokes the decolonization of knowledge. I think that today it was again affirmed that that is the core issue. The problem, the main problem is the colonization by oligarchs, mainly private players and powerful states. Uh, they they colonize, colonize knowledge and we need to decolonize that. And that is not possible to do if we do not call, decolonize the financial sector. And if we are to do so, we have to decolonize the values inspiring our notion of life and the world. And all this acts of decolonization can be done through very precise proposals. Of course, they are difficult to implement because such a decolonizing process touches, goes right at the heart of the system that we are denouncing. Second idea, liberating humankind. Uh, getting humankind free of its dependency from weapons. Luis mentioned it, many others said so. We are a community of human beings that are incapable of setting themselves free from the slavery of weapons and dominion. In 2020, we spent 2,000 billion euros in weapons. Are we crazy? That is not acceptable. And to do what with them? To defend ourselves from whom? That's an essential question. So freeing humankind. And that is one of the obligations that the programs for world cooperation should abide to. At the world level, the programs, the plans of the world social forum should be that of freeing humanity. The mm, as uh, just uh, in a similar manner to what uh, humans did when they freed themselves from slavery or to what colonized countries did when they freed themselves from their colonizers. Today, the main priority of the citizens' memorandum should be that of freeing humanity from the colonization of weapons. Now we have another six minutes, and I believe that Roberto Moreo and Roberto Musacchio, whom I warmly thank for their hard work to make uh, today's conference possible. And of course, I am afraid, I am sorry if some of the speakers could not make it. But uh, the people climbing the stairs in Liège and, and Brussels have, uh, um, are of comfort to us in thinking uh, that it is possible to organize new actions. I'll, I'll be very brief, and then I'll give the floor to Roberto. I have a proposal, and I wanted to say that on the basis of what I listened to, G20 will go on for the whole year. In October, there will be a, a summit with heads and states and government in October. Hopefully, will not longer be uh, confined. Uh, so, so my proposal is the following. Let's this group keep working the good work, uh, doing the good work, and it would be very nice if we could have a meeting between Europe and Africa, which is held at the European 
Parliament, so I'll take the advantage of Mark Botenga to suggest that such a meeting be organized so that in October we could have, in October, we could have a new general meeting. Roberto? You're going to have the last word. There are no conclusions that we wish to draw because I wouldn't be capable of drawing any conclusion. First of all, I wish to thank you very much because it was most enriching and lively and stimulating and challenging the discussion we've had. It gives us an opportunity to look uh, and take it take inspiration from the word around us and a sort of an offer to provide solutions, which uh, we need to give to the word. Heinz and uh, others have said that, that we must uh, uh, pursue this effort. Uh, it's, uh, it's very enriching to uh, share views with so many different uh, uh, people from different parts of the world. So this is a task uh, which we have to undertake uh, and, and we're very happy to support this effort. I hope that this can be just the first step to be taken in our climbing up to the sky, as Ricardo pointed out. So that's the wish uh, that I would like to express uh, for all of you. Uh, thank you so much again. So you'll get a report of uh, our discussion here today. And we'll be very happy if you could send us your feedback, your ideas uh, by mail. And through Ricardo, we can pursue our dialogue. Thank you very much. And then, of course, uh, allow me to thank the interpreters. Uh, that have had a hard time in trying to follow many hours of discussion. So I want to express my personal thanks on behalf of Transform and all of you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao, Heinz. Come are you? Ciao, 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 Ciao a tutti. Oh, grazie. Ciao. Grazie. Uh, grazie. Bye bye. Ciao Riccardo. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Stami bene. Ciao Diana. Ciao. <laughs> belle Thank cose, you. tante belle cose. Grazie, grazie. Vieni a Reggio, Lilia. Ciao Luis. Ciao Luis. Vieni a, vieni Ciao, a Reggio. Riccardo, carissimo. <laughs> bene, viva, Ciao. viva. Battagliamo contro la guerra. Adesso, <laughs> sì. Grazie, eh. grazie. Ciao. Ottimo.